Here we go, going live. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Pond Boss, coming at you live from my world headquarters of Pond Boss Magazine right here in the balmy hills of North Texas near Gordonville, Texas, up along the Red River. Jason Nepstad, of course, you'll be one of the first ones checking in. Good to see you, buddy. Glad you're here. We're going to, I tell you, we've got a pretty interesting topic tonight. I'm kind of excited about it just to see, see where we go with it. There was a, a great post put on the Palm Boss discussion forum a couple days ago by Eric West, who's a moderator, and Eric also has a regular column uh, where he writes about, um, oh, he does peer review papers and, and talks about the science of pond management, and he did an outstanding post. When you get a minute, you need to take a look at it. So here we go. I'm going to catch up here on the laptop, and there it is. Oh, holy cow, it's up here. We already got 13 people checking in. Let me see if I can get it up here. Let me get it up here where I can see it bigger, if it let me. You'd think by now that I would know how to do this, <clears throat> but maybe I don't. So anyway, here we go. The uh, let's see, I'm getting to try another way of going live during your broadcast. Another way of going live. I don't know how to do that. I don't know what that means. That's just the instruction I got. So tonight I want to talk about all the different pieces of the puzzle of the art of pond management. As a matter of fact, I love what, what Eric put up on the Pond Boss Forum. If you get a minute to go on that forum, you really should because it's pretty dadgum cool. If you get a minute to do that, go do it and take a look at it. All right, now I've got it up where I can see questions. I can see people checking in. Todd Austin, John Funk. John's got a question. I'm going to hit it in a minute. Pat Williamson checking in. Adam Todd Jeremy Duckworth, a couple other people. Frank James, good to see you guys. Robert Buckaloo. If I don't acknowledge you, that just means I probably didn't see you when you came on. But I'll go back later and I'll see you. Chuck Brinkman checking in from Missouri. Hey, Chuck. Troy Todd. Hey, Mike Cottrell, you know the drill. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comments section. Click like and share to your timeline. And hey, Mike Cottrell, guess who the winner is? You are. You get a hat. And a mug. If you're a Palm Boss subscriber, honestly, I don't know if you are or not, but if you're not, send us your address and we'll send it on. If you are a subscriber, Leanne will have that address. So we'll be able to get that to you. So congratulations. <clears throat> if you guys will, hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section. Share this video to your timeline right now and click like. Then you're eligible for the next drawing, which will be Probably right after um, right after Christmas. I see Peggy Kenyon. Hi, Peg. Good to see you, dear. Glad you're there. Brad Moram checking in. Good deal. So let's see here. Uh, I'm going to see what else we got. Then I'm going to get into the topic. Mark Wyman, Jeremy Duckworth, Jeff Connor. Good to see Jeff Connor. Hi, Jeff. Jeff's with Purina. Purina Mills. He sells a lot of fish food down in Central Texas. So what I want to do is I want to get into the art of pond management. You know... If you guys are fans of Pond Boss Magazine or you follow the forum or if you're subscribers to the magazine, you know one of the things that we that we really try to drive home all the time <coughs> are the four scientific fundamentals of uh, pond management, which, well, really there's five of them because it all starts with the water. If you don't have healthy, happy water, then none of these other things make any difference. And I have seen, I looked at the lake in, in South Carolina back, I don't know, about a month ago. And that guy has done everything right, everything, but he had a fish kill. And he had a fish kill because what he didn't know, and that's, you know, that happens to a lot of guys. It happens to me, and I do it for a living. And his issue was he had some kind of a toxic plankton or algae bloom back in the summer, and he couldn't identify it and lost a few fish. Now, it wasn't a catastrophic loss, but he did lose some fish. So had he known about some of the things we're going to talk about tonight, he had a shot at preventing it. So the fundamentals are make sure your water is happy. The second thing we preach is about um, the, the uh, habitat. I see Wade Bales checking in. Billy Bates checking in. Good to see you, Billy Bates. <clears throat> but the um, uh, habitat, food chain, great genetics, and a harvest plan. 
If you figure out those five things, clean water, great habitat, Willie Howe checking in, Paul Picard from South Louisiana, Willie Howe from North Texas, actually next door neighbor, Jack Hamilton checking in. Hey, Jack. So we got clean water. We got great habitat. We've got the best food chain. Because remember, you guys, you guys, I'm going to hear you talking right through this broadcast. How many pounds of bait fish does it take for a game fish to gain one pound? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can hear you. It's coming all coming all over here. 10 pounds of bait fish. You got to have clean water, great habitat, an outstanding food chain. If you want to grow big fish, you got to have... You got to have the right genetics and then you got to have a harvest plan. A, a, a pond is like a garden. At some point you'll have a bounty. You need to harvest it or nature will and you won't like the way nature does it. <clears throat> Looks like Willie and Marta are watching me from opposite ends of the house. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Daniel McWhorter checking in. Billy Bates. Tyler Wilkes. Yeah, Billy typed it in. He knows. 10 pounds. Taylor Wilkes checking in from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Go Pig Suey. Giga Maggie's by the way. So here's where I want to go. The post that that Eric West put up on the Pond Boss discussion forum on our website, pondboss.com. Click on the forum. It'll lead you to just thousands and thousands of posts. If you want to get a question answered quickly, that's a great place to go. But what, what uh, Eric was talking about is... Solitude Lake Management Company's fisheries biologist, chief fisheries biologist, Dave Beasley, wrote a story in this issue. He's got one in every issue. But this one is called Thinking Past the Obvious. And man, that is, a, that is an outstanding topic. And from that, Eric posted a couple of things that really gives people pause to think. And Leanne was looking at it today. And uh, actually yesterday, and she sent me this idea, and I loved it. So Lynn got it. I loved it. Jack Hamilton, when is an algae bloom too big and needs to be controlled? You know what? I'll tackle that here in a minute. Todd Corey, hey, Bob, St. John's, Michigan. David Atkinson checking in from Anguilla, British Virgin Islands. Glad to know they have internet there, David. <laughs> we miss you, dude. David lived in the neighborhood up until a couple of weeks ago when he is chasing a dream on an adventure out in the Bridges, Vir Bridgen, British Virgin Islands. <clears throat> so, what uh, what I want to drive home to start is water bodies are complex. And as one variable changes or shifts, it influences another variable, which influences another and on down the line. So, so when you're making management choices whether to do something or not do something, that has an influence on the next variable, which influences the next variable. And I'm going to give you some, some, some thoughts about that here in just a minute. Now, the problem with pond owners is a lot of the vis uh, issues that they see as problems are actually a symptom of the real problem. Now, let that soak in for a minute. Let's let that soak in. Issues that we see as a problem are often actually symptoms of a problem. I'll give you a classic example. Every spring, we get calls at Pond Bars World Headquarters and headquarters of Bob Lusk Outdoors where somebody's saying, you know, I got a whole lot of aquatic plants and they are a problem. No, they're not. They're the symptom of the problem. The problem is that everything has come together for those plants to grow. And if they if they grow in your pond in excessive amounts, then they cause the next variable to be a problem. They'll, they'll extract nutrients from the water. Uh, on cloudy days, they'll use more oxygen than they produce. So the plants are not the problem, they're a symptom. So as you begin to figure out the art of pond management, and I'll tackle that in more depth in a minute, that's when you will become a better steward and begin to see what needs to be done in the headlights rather than in the rear view mirror. <clears throat> so now the, you know, and one thing that Eric does in Eric's column, every issue, he, he, he goes through peer reviewed scientific papers. And one of the points he wanted to drive home that Dave Beasley made in the article, this issue is that, too many peer-reviewed uh, research 
projects are limited in their results because they have a single objective. And I'm going to give you a classic one of those. <clears throat> one, of our, one of our friends who's a fisheries biologist, um, PhD at South Dakota State University, did some research in Texas. And he was looking at stomach contents of largemouth bass as one of the topics of, of their scientific study. They didn't find a, one tilapia, well, I'm not going to say that, they didn't find tilapia babies as a significant source of food for largemouth bass 10 inches or bigger. So their recommendation to the landowner was don't stock tilapia anymore. Well, every year that landowner would stock tilapia, and I saw the results of that. The results were higher survival rates of baby bluegill, so those tilapia influenced the bluegill survival rates. There also was a, a, a measurable decline in filamentous algae with the tilapia stocked in that particular lake. But since that scientific study didn't find any tilapia in the bellies of 10 inch or bigger bass, the conclusion was they don't impact the bass. Absolutely untrue. Now, the research was true. They didn't find any tilapia babies or any tilapia at all to speak of, just a few in the bass stomachs of X number. I don't even know how many they, that they looked at, probably a thousand or more, but they didn't find but just a few. Well, the problem with that is that they didn't take into consideration in that peer-reviewed study of the impact that tilapia have on other variables inside that lake. And that's where the art of pond management really starts to come in. John Wilson checking in, Aquadoc. Hey, man. Hey, John. We've, uh, I've started doing some podcasts, and David Reich's podcast is up. I think it's in SoundCloud. Look for Pond Boss Productions. And I think there's three of them up now. Just to let everybody know, I've got some audio podcasts up as well. <clears throat> and you can, you can hear those three. And got a couple more being edited, getting ready to go. So... The thing that you got to remember is whenever you read a story in Pond Boss or if you read it in an American Fishery Society book or if you find it online, that story is going to be accurate about that topic. But what you have to figure out is what do you need to do to use science-based decisions and turn it into the art of managing a pond. I'm about to start my 40th year doing this stuff. And I tell you, in, that, in those 40 years, I started in January of 1980. And what I have learned over those years is, is there's so many var variables that can impact a pond. You know, the, there, there, a change in pH can impact a pond. We were looking at Richmond Mill Lake back in November. The hurricane that came through there, there were two hurricanes, Florence and then Michael, three weeks later, shoved so much fresh water with a higher pH through that it burned the plants, it scoured the creek, completely disrupted the habitat of that lake, and completely changed the fishery. We didn't find any baby fish hardly at all. You know, so those variables have impacted that lake. Now we got to figure out what to do about it. So in a few days, we'll know what to do about it. So what I want you to, here's your take home points. Don't depend on a single article or even a group of articles. Study as much as you can, and then you got to figure out what your pond will let you do and what it won't let you do. That is the art of pond management. At my house, we have eight ponds. Two of those ponds are tenth of an acre side by side. They are as different as night and day. One of them is an average of two feet deeper than the other one, and the soils are just a touch different. Not much, but just a little bit. Those two things cause those ponds to be totally different. And they're hatchery ponds. I can drain them dry, fill them back up, stock them, feed them, manage them, and we get totally different results. Fish spawn differently in one than they do the other. You know, in one pond we've got mostly for catfish. That's a put and take fishery. Because I know that the water is three to one, or the shore is three to one slope to eight feet, then it's flat. It's almost like a classic Mississippi catfish pond, except deeper. So I know that the fish we put in, we're not going to get a lot of reproduction out of those fish. So I don't count on that. So I manage that pond as its own entity. So what I'm trying to drive home tonight is don't just rely on a little bit of information to be making great big decisions. And when you do make those big decisions, think beyond the obvious. 
<clears throat> now, if you haven't seen this issue of Pond Boss, this is it right here. The November, December issue. Dave Beasley's story is in here. It's on page, let me see here. I'll tell you what it is. It is, let's see here. It's way up in the front, page 28. So I'm just going to pull this out and read a couple of things out of here. But you need to subscribe to the magazine if you haven't. $35 a year? Come on. All right, Thinking Past the Obvious by Dave Beasley. Here it is, right there. See it? Pond ownership is a journey that can prove to be exciting and fun as well as frustrating and disappointing. Good times are typically fueled by great memories of relaxing on the water or catching fish with family and friends or just the simple serenity that water gives. Now, I'm going to go on down here. Unfortunately, and I've already said this once, I think it deserves to be said again that Beasley put in here. Unfortunately for pond owners, issues viewed as problems are actually symptoms of the real problem. As a result, the obvious solution will usually not restore the pond back to times when things were good. Water bodies are complex, and as one variable shifts, it influences another, which influences another. This cause and effect process results in the need to address what caused the change rather than addressing what was affected by the change. That, folks, is rock-solid pond management advice. I'm going to pause right here, <clears throat> take a couple of questions, and then I'm going to get back as you think about what I'm telling you. John Funk said a question. He says, um, please include ideas for small northern ponds, especially for the food chains. Our bluegill only spawn once a season. And he can't find pumpkin seeds in Michigan. So, first of all, if anybody in the in the Michigan area knows where John can find pumpkin seeds, uh, say something in a thread here. Just 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 chime in and let him know where he can get some. To to tackle his other ones, some ideas about the food chain. The food chain should be based on the lifestyles of those fish in those waters. Now, here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> in the South bluegill spawn four to five times a year. So they're the perfect food chain for largemouth bass. Well, in the north, like what John's saying, his bluegill spawn once a year. Now, that, there's, there's a couple of reasons his bluegill spawn once a year. First of all, he's got a shorter bluegill growing season than we do in the south. And also, they're not nutritionally sound enough to, to develop eggs twice. So if his bluegill were fed, like Aquamax MVP, John, if you fed your bluegill, you'd more likely get two spawns a year, especially if you got them fed to where they go into the winter with, with really, really good stores of body fat and good stores of energy. They can develop eggs over the winter while the water's cold, so you'll get an earlier spawn. Typically, in, in, upper, in the, the Upper Peninsula and the top part of the Lower Peninsula of Michigan, bluegill will spawn about the 1st of July. You can speed that up a little bit, and you can add a spawn eight weeks or so after that. If, if you got it, if you got it clicking. Let's see here now, where you can get pumpkin seeds, I, I don't know. I don't know that area very well. Let's see, Dave Weber says, Merry Christmas. Good to see you. All right, now I saw a question up here earlier. I'm gonna scroll back down and find it, if I can find it. Well, it disappeared. Somebody asked a question and I'm not seeing it. Looks like it, my computer's not gonna let me go past a certain area here. So whatever that question was, the first one, I missed it. Ask it again, and I'll come back up here to, um, oh, here it is, Jack Hamilton. When is an algae bloom too big and needs to be controlled? <clears throat> an algae bloom, I've got, I've got two opinions about that. First of all, there's a normal algae bloom, and if the visibility, and, it, it, and also the density of that bloom, whether you should control it or not, depends on when it happens. If you've got a dense bloom going on right now, that's probably a harmful algae bloom, which is the second thing. If you have a harmful algae bloom, you need to deal with it sooner rather than later. Now, if you've got a good, healthy plankton bloom, you're watching the visibility depth of your water. Now, this is gonna vary from different parts of the state. In the north, you want more clarity in your water because you have this thing called winter that people in the south don't have, you know? so. You, you want to be measuring your water visibility. Like right now, your water should be clear. As clear as it's going to be all year long. You might have eight feet of visibility, but when that temperature starts to go up in the spring, if you've got nutrients dissolved into the water, you're going to see a plankton bloom or an algae bloom kick in when the water temperature hits about 55 to 60. By the time you hit 65, that bloom is growing and getting more dense. 
we use what's called a Sechi disc, where we measure the depth of the visibility. So basically what it is, if you've got, if you put a, a, a white spoon on the end of your fishing pole and you drop it down, when it disappears, raise it back up to, just till you can barely see it. And then when you can see it, measure the depth from the surface of the water to where that is. And if you've got 18 inches of visibility from the months of March until the 1st of June, you're fine. If the, if the visibility decreases, that's a problem. Now in the summertime, if you've got visibility of much less than 18 inches, that's a problem. Now if your water shifts gears and gets kind of a blue-green look to it, or kind of a lime green look to it, that's a symptom <coughs> that you that you are a signal that you may have a harmful algae bloom. So having a good plankton bloom is good. Now here's where the art comes in. You know, you gotta look at it and begin to figure out what's the difference. That's where you lean on a pro. That's where you lean on Bill Cody. That's when you send a sample into a lab and have it out analyzed where they can do an algae count. So if you've got a lot of dollars in a pond and you don't want to fish kill and you look like you've got a bloom where the visibility is 12, 14 inches in the summertime and it's got a funky green look to it, that's when you need help. And that's part of the art of pond management. So the, the way that you can, there's several ways to control an overbearing plankton or overbearing algae bloom. Of course, you can use an algae side. Here's the problem with that. If you use an algae side and you're not experienced with that, and you, if, if you just read the label and you go out and use it as the label says, you're gonna be well within the bounds of doing it right. The problem is, is if you use it like the label says and you kill too much algae in the middle of the summer, you can have an oxygen depletion. <laughs> so there's where the art of pond management comes in. You can treat at lower uh, levels, you can treat a section of the pond to dilute that algae bloom. So that's where the art of pond management starts to come in. Now, the problem with most of us is we got to do it by trial and error. And you may be four years into a pond project where you got $30,000 in it. You don't want to learn by trial and error. That's when it's worth the money to bring a pro in and, and, and learn from that pro based on your pond and what it's trying to teach you. Frank James says, last year I fertilized a total of 85 pounds in my seven and a half acre pond, but I never got visibility less than 30 to 36 inches. <clears throat> a total of seven tons of lime over three years. My tiny forage pond, which never got fertilizer lime, had a visibility around 10 inches. The fish in the main pond did great and got fairly good plant growth too with Kara American pond weed primarily. So should I fertilize even more next year, especially if I stock threadfin shad? I won't do it all at once, spread out over six to eight or four to six weeks. P.S. Love tilapia. <clears throat> well, Frank, here's the answer to that question, which is, now guys, this is a real, real thoughtful question. And Frank is, is learning, he's learning as he goes on this. The first couple of years were kind of rocky for fish production for Frank, but now his pond is beginning to mature, his lake is beginning to mature, and it's beginning to kind of come in its own. So, should you fertilize again next year? It, that, now that's gonna depend on water clarity. If you've got water six feet in visibility when the water temperature hits 60 inches, I mean 60 degrees, yeah, you need to fertilize. But if you've got enough nutrients <coughs> dissolved in that water column when the temperature gets right, you're gonna to start to see the visibility decrease. Here's my advice. Start checking visibility the first of March, do it about once a week and write it down. Plot it on an XY graph. If you can start to see visibility go from six feet to five feet to four feet to three feet and then level off at three feet, that's when you know you need to add some fertilizer. Now, here's the art of fertilization. Fertilization to get a plankton bloom is contingent on several variables, like what Dave's talking about with the comments that he made in that article. So the variables are alkalinity, rooted plant life, temperature of the water, how you apply the fertilizer, because if you go broadcast it and you don't get it dissolved into the water column and it sinks to the bottom, you're gonna be fertilizing bottom plants. So you gotta have at least 20 parts per million total alkalinity in order for cells of algae and plankton to develop their skeletal structure, their exoskeletons. 
See, nobody knows that. that. Nobody tells you that. So if your alkalinity isn't high enough, you can fertilize until the cows come home and you're not going to get a bloom. You know, so if your alkalinity is at least 20 parts per million, preferably 40 to 70, then you're going to be more likely to get a, a plankton bloom when you start. Now, here's the thing. When you fertilize, what are you doing? You're feeding the water, dissolving it into the water to feed the plankton and the microscopic algae. So what happens when that food runs out? Then they die. So here's the way a plankton bloom goes, Frank, is when you fertilize the water, you're creating the primary productivity of the microscopic, mostly single cell uh, plants that are mostly made up of algae, which in turn starts to feed zooplankton, which are little bitty microscopic animals, you know, like paramecums and e amoebas that we saw under the microscope when we were in high school or junior high now, I guess, or heck, maybe even kindergarten, I don't know. So once you get that fertility level up to grow that plankton bloom, you'll start to see zooplankton feeding on it, and that's when the water color changes. The water goes from kind of a lime green to a, to a, a darker green to kind of an olive green, and when it hits that olive green color, that's when you know zooplankton are beginning to impact it. It'll go from that olive green to kind of an olive brown, and then from an olive brown to a brownish olive. That's your cue in the art of pond management that you need to give it another nudge because now the zooplankton are overeating the phytoplankton, and pretty soon you're going to have a plankton crash. And that can be triggered by running out of food. That can be triggered by a rainstorm. That can be triggered by a cold front in the middle of summer, which we have those every year somewhere in the United States. So that's part of the art of pond management. Let's see here. <clears throat> yeah, Frank says, I ask that because the rules say I'm fertilizing enough already. Well, that's because when you read the label on fertilizer, and I'm going to tell everybody to go by the label, but what I'm also going to tell you is there are so many other variables that influence the uh, effect of your cause that you need to think beyond the obvious. So Frank, when you're fertilizing, anybody else out there, when you're fertilizing your pond next spring, if you want to do that, you need to be measuring visibility on a regular basis, preferably twice a week. You know, now, now when the water temperature's cooler, it takes a little bit longer for a bloom to kick in. You know, when the water's warmer, it can happen overnight. So you need to be checking visibility. If it stays static, then give it a half dose. If it stays static, give it another week or 10 days, give it a half dose again. So full dose, half dose, one fourth dose, basically. So every time you give it a dose, cut it in half. And when you finally get that bloom, the next thing you want to do is keep your fertility level or your visibility at that depth, which is going to be 18 inches to 30 inches. Now used to, I'd say, let's get to 18 to 24 inches visibility and, and, and that's perfect. But now with the fish foods that are out there, holy cow, we can, we can hedge our bets on getting the water too fertile. We do want fertility because fertility does two things, two important things. When your baby fish are first hatched, they don't have any energy stores. They have no fat. All they are is an egg, you know, and the yolk of the egg, egg is their energy. When they absorb that yolk, they have to eat. When they have a mouth about half as big as the head of a pin, they got to glean their food from the water column. Fertility, good fertile water, that's feeding your newly hatched fish which is the key to your food chain. So now we got happy water and we're creating food chain with the art of the way that you're fertilizing the pond to get the plankton bloom that you want. All right, so then the second thing that that plankton bloom does is it blocks sunlight off the bottom. Remember early in this conversation, I said sometimes well, the phone, and this happens every year, <clears throat> the phone will ring, somebody says, man, we got way, way, way too many plants. We need to do something about it. They're a problem. Plants aren't this problem. They're a symptom. Plants grow because they have three things. They have food, they have sunlight, and they have the right temperature. If you take away any one of those three, plants are not going to grow, including plankton, if you take away any of those three. So when you've got a plankton bloom that's, say, 24 to 30 inches, 
you can pretty well bet that rooted plants are not going to grow below that plankton bloom because the sun can't penetrate to the bottom. Holy cow, it's already 7 o'clock. I can't believe I talked this much. 35 bucks a year, guys. If you haven't subscribed to Pond Boss, please do that. $35 a year. Cheaper than a good bottle of wine on a Friday night from a restaurant. So, uh, just oblige us. This is what fuels the economy of Pond Boss, is this. Also, if you haven't seen it before, email us at info at pondboss.com. Ask for a sample. Give us your address. We'll send you one. <coughs> also, we've got a bunch of these left. Well, not that many. We've got a few Pond Boss resource guides. Inside this resource guide are vetted vendors that can help you at all different kinds of kinds of uh, different pond management topics, from aeration to fish food to feeders. Speaking of feeders, Texas Hunter is a sponsor of ours. Thanks to Texas Hunter. Look at one of their hats. Look here. Texas Hunter products. Check them out. They're really, really solid, strong, and in, 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 as as uh, uh, vendors and as educators in the pond management business. Also, Purina Mills. They've worked really, really hard to help create products that you and I can use out in the field. Now, while I'm taking this pause before we get back onto the topic, <clears throat> another uh, important thing to remind you is the Society of Lake Management Professionals Summit is coming up in January in Memphis, Tennessee. And I see Stephen Workman checking in from Memphis. Glad to see you, buddy. Um, and that, even though that summit slash conference is, is designed for professional lake management companies and people in the business, those of you that have an advanced knowledge or you want to learn much, much more about pond management, Jason Nepstad, you might be one of those guys. Uh, take a look at that. Look for, um, I think it's lakeprofessionals.org, or if you'll just Google Society of Lake Management Professionals, you can see and you can learn about that. Jonathan Webb checking in from Indiana. Tom Davis, Ohio. Jason Nepstad says, we're planning to purchase threadfin shad for our lake. Is there much we can do to promote better spawning for this fish? Absolutely. Now, Jason, when you get ready to stock threadfins in there, one thing that you've got, I've been on this lake with you, Jason, so to kind of inform everybody else, this lake is a really fertile lake. It's got a lot of years under its belt. It's got literally hundreds of houses in the neighborhood. There's two or three dams upstream that have, have burst with floods from hurricanes over the last four or five years. So this lake has had a big influx of, of uh, nutrients and sediment in the upper reaches of the different coves. <clears throat> because of that, there's a heavy plankton bloom, plus the lake is just loaded with carp, common carp, Israeli carp, uh, mirror carp. Um, it's got koi goldfish in it. And those are the dominant species of fish simply by mass. Maybe not so much by numbers, but by mass. So, there's it's really hard for native aquatic plants to get established in McFadden Lake in Fayetteville, uh, Fayetteville North Carolina. So, Jason's question is a good question. Jason, where all that alligator weed is, threadfins will stick their eggs on that. But otherwise, threadfin shad like to stick their eggs on grass. So anywhere there's some submerged vegetation, and what I do in small ponds, and you might even do this around your, your lake if you want to, uh, is you can add some bales of straw and break If you can go buy six or eight straw bales of hay and break them up and put them in the water right along the edges of the lake, those threadfins will spawn all over that stuff, and they do it at daylight. So let's see here. Stephen Workman, hello from Memphis. First time catching you live, and I watch every video you put out. Well, you know what, Stephen? I'm glad you do that. That makes it worth it. I appreciate the compliment. I'm glad you do that. I'm glad somebody's watching it. <clears throat> okay, so Ben Strange says, hello, why do bluegill taste so good? They're my favorite fish. Well, it's because they're white, flaky meat, and you grew up eating them, just like I did. Frank James says, sorry, I meant slime seven tons per acre. Okay, that's a big difference. So now, Frank, knowing that you put seven tons of lime per acre, now that might sound like it's too much, but what that's going to do, not all, all of that lime is going to dissolve all at one time. It's going to dissolve until the water reaches whatever saturation it wants. Chances are you're going to hit about 40 to 60 parts per million and hold there until that lime runs out. The good news is you're not going to run out for a long time. 
The only way you're going to run out of lime is if you get some flushing rains. And that means significant flushing rains to where the lime, lime water, the water that's got lime dissolved in it, flushes on down the stream. That's when the lime leaves. So seven tons per acre, I love that. I think that's great. That, that is not going to cause your, your alkalinity to spike and then drop. It isn't going to do that. It's going to reach a medium and that's where it's going to stay. So what that's going to do is create consistency, which is something real, real important in cause and effect. Think about this. Here's part of the art of pond management. <clears throat> Every time there's a change, the pond has to respond. So let's say this pond by nature has 10 parts per million um, alkalinity, which might be enough to cause some, some, something to grow toward the, the interface of the bottom of the pond, the soil, and the water. But then it rains and flushes it. It goes from 10 to zero. Okay, the pond's going to respond to that. You know, where with Frank, when you've got seven tons per acre, what you've done is you've taken away one of the variables, which is the inconsistency of the alkalinity. It's going to be really consistent. Now, when you get a flushing rain, it might go from whatever it is, 40 parts per million to 30, but it won't stay that way very long. It'll come right back up to 40. So what you've done is you have stabilized a variable that's going to make your fertilization program become more predictable. So that's, that's going to help you. That's part of what I'm talking about with the art of pond management. Chris Rigoni, got pumpkin seeds up here in the Upper Peninsula. Hopefully I can get my hands on some out of the local lakes and rivers this spring. Pretty good idea. I like that, Chris. Craig Guffin got a smiley face up here. Chris Rigoni's asking, he says, if I aerate in the winter, do I need the diffuser in the deepest part? The deep side is shady and the solar panel will not get enough light. It's a brand new pond and there are some rainbows in there and I don't want to waste them. Do not aerate in the deepest part of the water. Here's why. When you're, when you're north of the Mason-Dixon line, actually even when you're along the Mason-Dixon line, and when you have ice on the pond, you're going to stabilize the temperature of the water at the bottom. The water at the bottom, remember, I preach this over and over and over. I'm going to drive it home again tonight. Water is its densest at 39 degrees Fahrenheit. If you take one gallon of water at 39 degrees and you weigh it, that's the heaviest it's going to be. As it gets cooler, it's going to expand. As it gets warmer, it's going to expand. That's why ice floats. Ice is at least 32 degrees. Can I get an amen? Yes, it is. That means the water beneath the ice is warmer than 32 degrees. That's because of the density of that water. So when you're aerating the deeper water, what you're going to do is you're going to take that thermal um, refuge away from your fish. Believe it or not, rainbow trout don't like water 32 and a half degrees. They'd rather have water in the 40s and 50s, preferably in the 50s. That's what rainbow want, rainbow trout. So if you're going to aerate in the wintertime, bring the diffuser up into the water that's about half as deep as the deepest. And also keep in mind that, that's, that, that when you're going to aerate with a bottom diffused aerator and you bring that diffuser shallow, you're going to create some open water. Now, if you're going to have open water, it really needs to be close to the shore so an animal can't walk out on the ice and fall in it and can't get out. Or a human. Or a tractor. You know, somebody driving out there on it. So bring that diffuser in. If, you're, if your pond is 15 feet deep, I'd set my diffuser at 5 feet deep. And that way you can keep a hole open. You can keep aerating. But you're also protecting that thermal refuge down in the deeper hole of water for your rainbow trout. If they don't have enough oxygen, they're going to come get it. They're going to come up where there is more oxygen and they'll get it. Chuck Brinkman, last week you made a brief comment about the third year and growth rate. Since I'm going into my third year, this really caught my attention. Can you touch on this subject, please? You bet. <clears throat> Chuck, what I'm talking about is with a brand new pond, newly stocked, and stocked properly, by the third year, what's going on is your originally stocked fish have grown large enough to begin to reproduce. So when that happens, here's what's going on. When you first stock it, here's your food chain. Your food chain grows. You had your predator fish, whether it's largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, walleye, whatever you got going, tiger muskies. By about 18 months to two years, it's going to start to level off. In the third year, what happens is the predators start to gain an advantage because you have more mouths. Let's just take largemouth bass, for example. When the largemouth bass that you stock originally 
start spawning some of them in their second year in central Missouri, their babies are going to start feeding on the food chain on these tiny little fish. So your food chain is going to begin to decline. So that's where one of the topics of pond management harvest comes in. You got to be ready to start harvesting fish. Now you don't really want to harvest the originally stocked fish. You want to let them get as big as they can with a few exceptions. It's okay to take underperformers and in the case of largemouth bass, take the males out. They're not going to get very big. But what you're looking for essentially in that third year is the young of the year babies that are getting to the point that they're going to get overcrowded and you've lost control of the numbers of fish simply because they're reproducing and because that's what they do. So by the art, here's the art of pond management. If you're tracking lengths and weights of fish that you're catching, and Chuck, you, you love your wife and you love those girls and they love to fish. And you love to bait hooks and take fish off. Start weighing and measuring some of those fish. The fish are going to tell you when it's time to begin to cull some of them in that third, fourth, and fifth year because what you'll see is their body condition will start to deteriorate in certain size classes. So typically that's going to be bass that are young of the year once they hit 9 to 13 or 14 inches. When that happens and their weight begins to drop, remember this. In order for a bass to hit 14 uh, 14 inches, it's got to weigh somewhere around 1 pound 7 ounces. If it weighs less than that, odds are really high it lost weight. So what you're looking for is you're looking for trends of those fish and when to harvest them. And you do that by judging body condition. That's part of the art. So now let me tie some of this art together and I'm going to hit some of these other, other questions that I see popping up. <clears throat> when you've got the right plankton bloom, you got a respectable feeding program and you're seeing growth rates increase on fish that you've targeted with feed. You're checking your visibility depths. You're looking at your water chemistry to see that the alkalinity is right and the pH is right. And then you're catching a few fish and studying their body condition. You combine all those things, then you can start making solid decisions on whether to fertilize more, feed less, feed more, harvest fish, stock fish. And that's where the science holds your hand as you become the artist for your pond. I see Bruce Candelo checking in. Bruce, Bruce has got the art of pond management better than anybody I've ever met. He takes, you know, one of the things, I'm a firm believer in God and I'm a firm believer in as a Christian in that God put these things out here. I also believe that God, if we follow his will, he will coach us as to what we need to do. The pond does the same thing. If you understand what that pond will allow you to do, and then you guide it with, with a good, solid foundation of science-based artwork, then you're going to get it like you want it. Now, here's the thing. It's never like you want it. <laughs> It may be there for a little bit, then it's going to want to change. A perfect example of that is I am now getting more and more questions about otters, predators. I've got people saying, man, I don't have any big fish anymore, but I got otters. You know, so any time that we work hard to create a bounty, nature's going to want to take that away. So part of the art of pond management is to be vigilant and aware of the different things that can impact the variables that you're working hard to bring together to make the best pond you want. Now, I'm letting it get a little bit complicated, so I'm going to back up a little bit. Nobody wants to really get out there and try to solve every single crisis. I just want a pond. And I just want healthy fish. That's what I want. I mean, 99% of the people I talk to, that's what they say. All right, well... The more you learn about it, the more complicated it gets. But to simplify it, make sure your water's clean. How do you know that? You're checking visibility. It's okay to do a preemptive strike by studying the, 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 the types of, of algae that you got. Bill Cody can do that. You can find him on the Palm Boss Forum. If you can't find him, send an email to info at palmboss.com and I'll forward it to him. You know, so if you understand that water quality has to be good 
And then you're really just managing that pot balance of fish. <clears throat> In order to understand the art of pond management to balance a fishery, here's what that really means. A balanced fishery means that you've got all the different sizes of all the different fish and they're all chunky or above average. Well, if you have that, you've got a balanced pond. Keep in mind that nature wants to keep it from being balanced. Think about coyotes and, and rabbits. You know, trying to get a pond to be balanced is like, I love what Mike Mitchell told me, a fisheries biologist in, in, in uh, uh, Colorado a few years ago. He says, it's like pushing a giant beach ball up the side of a mountain. You start pushing it, it's going to lean this way. Then you got to get over, push it back this way. That's what pond management is. And part of your job as artists with a science-based management strategy is to see when those changes are about to happen and then remedy it. Understanding <clears throat> that the choice that you make to change it is going to have a positive effect. One, two, three variables beyond the obvious. Read that article in this issue of Pond Boss. It drives it home. Let's see here. I'm going to go back here. Jack Hamilton, my pond is in southern Indiana. Whom would you recommend for algae control advice and products? Um, I would talk to Matt Rail, which is American Pond and Lake Management. He's in Rusheville. And then there's another company in southern Indiana. Oh, south of Columbus. Good gosh, I can't think of them. Uh, if you go to pondboss.com and look on the, on the resource page, they're all, all the ones I know of are listed there. Lucio Garza from Northeast Arkansas. Hey, man, good to see you. Hey, thanks for referring Martin Thompson. We appreciate that. Frank James, thanks, Bob. Really helpful. You're welcome. Todd Corey had a new pond just dug in Michigan. They found a water sand while digging at around 15 feet deep, which is good with us. The question is, on the natural filtration due to the sand, after being dug, it was crystal clear in 24 hours. How can you manage water quality with constant water turnover naturally? Feed the fish. <clears throat> use, use some fish that you can feed. Because one of the good things about a water table is it's going to be as consistent as the table that feeds it, which means you're going to be at the mercy of that water table. If it's from a river, you know, a quarter of a mile away, you're going to be influenced by the water levels of the river rising and falling and the influence of that water circulation. I would take that. I mean, I would much rather have water moving than water that was sitting static that never moved at all. So that's really a pretty good thing. You can... You can, if you'll, if you'll stock a few fish that you can feed, you're going to see great production in that water. And I wouldn't be afraid to, uh, to fertilize it. I see Gene Gilliland checking in. Hi, Gene. Gene and I went to college together. Gene is a uh, conservation director. And, I, you know, Gene <clears throat> has been with BASS for a long, long time. He was uh, a biologist that moved away up the food chain in Oklahoma outstanding guy. He's the guy that gets his hands wet even to this day. I mean, you, you'll catch Gene out catching fish, handling fish. He's the guy under the stage at the BASS events taking the fish after they've been weighed, handling them, taking care of them, loving on them so they can be released healthy back into that lake. Fred Bingaman checking in. Hey, Fred. Illinois. Daryl Lenz. Hello, Bob. Good to see you. So, Let's see here. Paul Picard said, Bob, your explanations on pond fertilization and the colors to look for are excellent. You've done a terrific job. Holy cow, my head's getting big. <clears throat> Love the live broadcast. Plan my Wednesdays around them when at all possible while everybody else goes to church, right? <laughs> we moved uh, 10 years ago. We are in North Mississippi in Starkville. Oh, okay. Well, Paul Picard used to be in Louisiana. Of course, going by that name, you know he's got to be from Louisiana. And Paul's been a fisheries biologist for a long, long time. Got to meet him, I don't know, probably 20 years ago uh, when he was doing some pond management then. So, it is 7.20, knocking on the door. I think I pretty well wrapped up the main topics I wanted to cover. If you got some more questions, pitch them at me right quick. I'm going to scroll back here and make sure I didn't miss any. Let me see here. Yep, I think I've gotten, I don't think I missed any. If I did, you guys hit me with it. Dean gives me a thumb. I mean, Gene gives me a thumbs up. Good to see you, Gene. Glad you're listening in today. <clears throat> so here's, here, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to say that if you guys will take the very basics of pond management, which are, here's your take home points, good, clean, healthy, happy water. That's my favorite term. 
with the very best habitat for the fish that you choose to manage for, with a great food chain that you manage in your pond, with genetics to help you get the sizes that you want, coupled with a, with a, with a really solid, active harvest plan, and you combine those and understand the variables of all these things, you're gonna be a better pond manager. Now, it gets drilled down, it gets more complicated. Remember a while ago I said Threadfin Shad, answering Jason's question, Threadfin Shad spawn on vegetation? Well, if you don't have any vegetation, they're not gonna spawn. If your water's clear, they're not gonna survive. They're filter feeders. So take time to learn about the different species of fish and the life stages of those species of fish, and then you'll get a better understanding to help you get where you wanna go as you figure out the art of pond management. See Dick Tabbert joining in. Dick, you're gonna to have to go back to the beginning and listen in. This is one of the better broadcasts because it's such a good topic. So folks, listen, I wanna thank you for listening in. Remember Pond Boss Magazine? Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comments section. Click like, share this video, and you'll be eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug. Congratulations, Mike Cottrell, today's winner from Hearst, Texas. And <clears throat> until, uh, you know what? Next Wednesday is the day after Christmas. I'm going to be gone. So y'all get the day off next Wednesday. So I'm going to thank you for checking in. Deeply appreciate it. Merry Christmas to you guys. And uh, I, I love your loyalty and your faithfulness for checking in every Wednesday night. So until, I guess it'll be January 2nd. I'll see you guys next year. Appreciate you tuning in. Adios.